So we're so glad to have you back with us. We're excited right now because we're continuing now in our fourth installment of this series called Increase Your Reach. Uh, it's based out of the book of Matthew 28, uh, 19 and 20. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always until the very end of the age. It's my contention that um, this is actually our job title and job description. And so um, what happened is in week one, we talked about the job title uh, as an ambassador and, and what that actually looks like. And then in week two, we got into the job description and the job description there we find the purpose, the essential function and the analysis for what we're called to do. And the essential functions are kind of the core aspects of what we're um, called to do as believers according to our job description, both in our everyday life as well as in our spiritual walk with Christ. And in that, there are four ones that we are identifying as a part of this particular scripture, the go, the make, the baptize, and the teach. And so last week we talked about make disciples. First week was to go. Last week, uh, second week was of the essential functions was to make disciples. And so now in this week, we are moving into baptize. Oh my goodness. Baptize them, uh, part four of Increase Your Reach is going to be a phenomenal time of considering something that is actually a Christian sacrament for us. Something that started really right at the beginning of the church and was going on actually as far back as the children of Israel. Um, as some, If someone were to convert to Judaism, they would be baptized. So we find baptism is not something new at all, but it is something that has been with us as believers for quite some time. And so we're going to be working uh, today as we look at baptize them from the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 37 to 41 baptize them Acts chapter 2 verses 37 through 31 now as we're preparing to read that I want to just kind of bring you up to speed on what was happening during this time if you recall as we have been talking about over the last several weeks we've climaxed from uh, before Easter with Palm Sunday all the way through till the resurrection we are tracking when Christ was uh, crucified, when he died, when he was buried, when he resurrected, and then he would progress to where he is meeting with the disciples. He's been seen by some 500 individuals um, post-resurrection, and now what we have going on is him um, giving uh, directions to the disciples or the apostles as it were, and they were to go to a place and they were to wait for the Holy Spirit. Well, this is where we are now in this particular part of the word where the disciples have gone uh, into this space, likely the upper room, and they are now waiting for the uh, Holy Spirit to fall on them and it actually comes. And when it comes, it comes in spectacular fashion. And as it comes, what happens is there are 120 Folks there, it comes and others are saying it. And so in this process of it uh, coming, there begins to be this question of what's going on by individuals who are there because they're able to hear in their native tongue uh, people speaking their native language who weren't from their native land. And it was an incredible sight to behold, I'm sure. And so uh, what began to happen is they began to question what was going on and it questioned uh, the questions ended up going to the to the degree of ass asserting that maybe they were uh, um, under the influence of alcohol maybe they had been drinking too much because of all the commotion that was taking place and as uh, those questions begin to surface what happens is Peter steps up and he begins to answer their questions and he asserts that, in fact, they are not drunk. And then he goes into a, 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 a long a diatribe about explaining to the Jewish individuals present how they had murdered the promised Messiah. And here he goes line by line in a very eloquent manner, helping them to understand and in the process become convicted about what they had done to our Savior. And so... Uh, this is where we find ourselves. He goes through this explanation and articulates point by point 
um, who the Messiah was and what they did. And they now are responding to him. This is where we actually pick up. When he goes through and says everything that he says, they are at a climactic point where they are ready to, to well, what should we do? And this is the point in the scripture where we're actually picking up. Come on, let's read it together. It says, Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off and all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number in that day. And so why it's important for us to understand what's happening with this notion of baptism is, um, as with anything else, once we get our hands on it, it becomes a confusing and potentially chaotic thing. There are so many thoughts around baptism who should do it, when they should do it, what age should you be, can you be sprinkled, can it be poured, do you have to be uh, dipped, do you have to be fully submerged, um, do you have to get baptized in order to be truly saved? There are so many questions, so many arguments that swirl around this very basic process that all we wanna do is highlight some things for you on today that would help you to understand what this baptism, often called right now the believer's baptism, actually includes. There's all kinds of baptisms that you can see. Now, literally maybe somewhere between six and nine of them are present in the scriptures, depending on how you read them, both from the Old Testament and, and the New. So for instance, we're not gonna go there, but for instance, when the children of Israel walked through the Red Sea and, and were going through the water, that's a, a, the scripture refers to that as a form of baptism, being baptized to Moses. Here, we are walking through this process we're walking through this understanding of how to uh, make disciples and how we're to uh, um, do, fulfill the call that Christ has to increase our reach and looking at how important this notion of baptism is after we go and after we um, make disciples. Now we're talking about baptizing them. Now we've, we've caught them. Now we're starting the process of cleaning them. So let's start off by looking at point number one, according to the scriptures that we have just read. Um, first thing that I want us to be aware of from the scriptures, uh, Acts 2, 37 and 41, the first thing that this baptism includes, the believer's baptism as it were, it includes redemption. Verse 38 says, repent and be baptized every one of you. Repent and be baptized every one of you. Let's look at uh, something that I was just kind of toying with. I don't know if you're like me, um, uh, if we go to the to the next slide. When we go, when, when I think back to um, school and I think back to, to high school and junior high school, as soon as you started putting letters with mathematics, I had a problem. I was just trying my best to think of a way that we can kind of get some sort of algebraic understanding from a Christian perspective of what this redemption piece looks like. So it's a G, right? You remember, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, you remember all that good stuff? So we have the G meaning something with the F plus the R plus the S equaling the B. Well, let's give the answer because I don't want you stressing out like I used to do in algebra class when they added letters to numbers. So what does this mean when we say redemption? It means grace um, multiplying, so to speak, or, 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 or bringing to pass or, 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 or lifting up or so to speak, multiplying the faith that and the repentance that we bring. Let's go to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It says, for by grace, it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Let's go back to that screen. Let's go back to me now. Let's understand that this situation with redemption is not anything that you and I do per se. It is the grace of God that multiplies it. It is the grace of God that puts us in the way. Christ does the work on the cross. He finishes the work once and for all, but then 
his grace, God's grace facilitates and bodes us through the power of the Holy Spirit to a closer relationship. And then repentance. Let's go to Acts 2 and 38. And here's what it says. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Come back to me now. So now we have the grace and the faith that we bring and the repentance now let's continue on to the S, submission. Let's go to Mark verse, uh, chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. Here's what it says. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Come back to me again. So now we see we're building continually. We have the grace, we have faith, and repentance, we have submission. All of this equates to being Christ-like and getting baptized. Let's go to Matthew 3 and 13 so that we can look at this. Then Jesus came to Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. All right, come back to me. This is powerful because when it's all said and done, this is the very way that we get to redemption. By God's grace, Christ finished work on the cross then us having our faith and moving from our faith into the position of submission so that we can then be Christ-like and be baptized. Listen, if Christ needed to be baptized as an act of obedience to the Father, then who are you and I not to be like Christ and be obedient? This is what it's about. That redemption piece comes because you and I are blessed by God's grace. We are blessed by Christ's work on the cross. And then we make a response to the Spirit's boating, to the Spirit's invitation. And when that happens, we are Christ-like walking in obedience. That's number one. Number two is reception. Reception. Here is what this baptism includes. Reception. Not only does it have redemption, but it has reception. Verse 38 continues and says, In the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit. So the word reception, come back to me, the word reception means to be in a state of receiving. It means to be like a continual receiving. Think about a, a wedding reception. You're in, you're in a mode of receiving where you're just continually receiving. This is the picture that is painted for us here. Here's why. There are a few things that come as this scripture denotes that come with us being able to receive continually as we walk into baptism and, 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 and an act of obedience. Let's put that up. It says um, name, uh, we, we get the name, we get the forgiveness and we get the Holy Spirit. Let's look at each of them really quickly. Number one, the name, we get the authority of Christ. Let's put up Matthew 28 and 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Let's come back to me now. Let's talk about this for a second. We've got to understand that you and I are not walking as weaklings who are following a, a, a placid savior who has no power and no authority. You and I are walking around as uh, joint heirs of Christ who is the son of the living God. What this means is there are situations that you and I are facing that we don't have to be subject to. We don't have to find ourselves beat down by the circumstances of life as they come upon us. No matter what's happening, we can walk in victory because we have the authority of Christ. We are baptized in Jesus' name. We are moving out in his authority. What it says in Matthew 20, 18 is that he has all power in heaven and in earth. All power. All power. What do you get from all? Nothing. All means all. And in this situation, we need to start to walk a little bit taller, walk a little bit more with our chest upright and our chin up because we are sons of God. We are joint heirs with Christ and we walk in his authority. The other thing that reception gives us is forgiveness. Forgiveness. Let's put that up. Forgiveness. Propitiation is a fancy word for forgiveness. Let's look at the exact definition, or I don't want to call it exact, but let's look at the de definition as described in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Here's what it says. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness 
of God. This is straightforward. Here's what I love about this. All of this time from the book of Genesis all the way through to now, God has been working through and trying to reconcile us into the ability to have a right relationship with him. So because we are born into sin because of the Adamic curse, now we find ourselves progressing to the point where Christ has died on the cross and he has finished the work. Now we get to apply for that work as it were. We get to take advantage of that work and walk in that work and be forgiven. I don't know about you, but there are things in my past that I'm just not proud of. There are things that I could have done better. There are things that I ask myself, why did I do that? If you're at all like me, then sometimes you can find yourself uh, um, challenged and, and held in bondage by things that you've done in the past. Sometimes we'll make a decision in, in, our, in our previous lives and we'll uh, uh, move forward and we'll still have to be dealing with the shackles or the results of those poor decisions from our past. And what that can do sometimes is it helps us to stay in bondage. Well, because of his forgiveness, you and I don't have to be condemned forever. We have to pay a price. We have to deal with uh, 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 things that grow up because of poor decisions, but you don't have to stay mentally shackled to those poor decisions. Christ has forgiven us. There's therefore now no condemnation, Romans 8 and 1. So it allows for us to be able to stand up and say, yes, I made a mistake. Yes, yesterday's decisions weren't the best, but I don't have to be stuck there in any way, shape, or form. Instead, I can walk in the forgiveness that Christ's blood provides for us. Listen, what's bigger, your issue or Christ's blood? What's more powerful, the issue that had you in bondage or Christ's blood? What is the thing that you need to be looking at? Do you need to be concentrating on the poor decisions of yesteryear or do you need to be basing yourself in the reality of the power of Christ's blood? If you and I could begin to walk more effectively in the power of Christ because of his blood, then things that had us in bondage in the past will no longer have us in bondage. We don't have to be subject to those thoughts. We don't have to be in bondage to those fears and those feelings. Instead, we can walk in forgiveness and wholeness. Reception gives us name, gives us forgiveness. And finally, it gives us the Holy Spirit. This is all under reception, the Holy Spirit. Here's what I love. The Holy Spirit actually empowers. This is all under reception. He said he's, uh, he's going to give us uh, the, the Holy Spirit, which is our gift, according to that scripture. So now let's go to Galatians 5.22. This is one of my all-time favorite scriptures because this is one that just, I tell you what, you can always hold this up against decisions that you're making um, as and it helps you to see whether you're doing what you need to be doing by the power of God or by your own flesh and, 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 and worldly desires. I should I put it that way to sound very Christianese. Here's what it says. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control against such things. There is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Listen, you get all of these things under reception, under reception by itself. According to the scripture, this gift of the spirit is something that is an absolute game changer. Listen, by us trying to do something by ourselves, we will fail every single time. You see it evidenced in scriptures. You see the children of Israel, apart from God, living on the inside of them, propelling them towards a life of, 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 of deliverance and a life of overcoming, they end up in this virtual trap of continuing to sin and then be forgiven, then sin and be forgiven, then let God down and then be forgiven and let God down and be forgiven. It's just a cycle that continues. What ends up happening is God has to replace our stony, our stony hearts with hearts of flesh. And that is uh, typified by the spirit coming into our lives. And then we see this love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control as the operators and the drivers of decisions that we make. Whenever you are challenged, you can bring up Galatians 5, 22 through 24 and see if you're walking by the spirit or if you're walking by something else. That is the standard and we get access to it by way of this reception in baptism. Then finally, this baptism includes not only redemption, not only reception, but also a reconstitution. Verse 39 says, the promise is for you, for you and your children and for all who are far off, 
uh, all uh, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Right. So let's go. I want to look at this one. I want to look at the book of Romans uh, chapter eight, verse 11, really quickly, just to highlight. Here's what it says. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. All right. Here's what it looks like. This reconstitution is so important because we just can't do it without Christ. We can't do it without God the Father. We can't do it without the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. It is the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. It is the same spirit that empowered him to get up. It's the same spirit that pushes us forward. It's the same spirit that we can walk in because we now are created in his image, in his likeness at a different degree, because now it's not just we're animated and he's supporting us from the outside, but actually he is living on the inside of us. Listen, it wasn't good enough for him to just walk alongside of us in the garden. It, 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 obviously, it, it, it didn't work for us because we failed even then. It, it wasn't good enough for him to lead us as that he led the children of Israel by night and, and by day. Look, it, it was not good enough. It was not good enough for him to operate in a, in a tabernacle, in a temporary dwelling place. Uh, it wasn't good enough for him to be in the elaborate temple that was built where a priest would go into once a year and, and sacrifice for the sin offerings of the people. Uh, it, it was not good enough. What God had in mind is that he would not just come alongside us, but that he would reside inside of us. This is a different I mean, a totally different thing that, yes, we are here. We are uniquely, we are wonderfully made. But now you get the add the difference maker in that we are reconstituted with the Holy Spirit living on the inside. This is an extraordinary change to how everything works. Now you and I have the definite capability, the more that we pray, the more that we read our Bible, the more that we spend quiet time in his presence, we have the ability to overcome anything. Paul says it best, to live is Christ, to die is gain. What he's saying in that scripture in essence is, it doesn't matter what happens to him. If he lives, he's gonna stay here and be like Christ and help and keep forwarding the mission of God in the earth realm. But if he dies, he gets to go to glory and be with Jesus. Listen. What this basically means is that no matter what, you and I win. This is why, this is the heart of us not having to be worried about what happens in this life because we're not limited to what happens here. See, what happens sometimes for us is that we get so caught up in the possessions of this world, we get so caught up in the things of this world, we get so caught up in all the accoutrements of this world that we forget that this is just a, a, a for, for, for all intents and purposes, this is just the practice run. This is just a dress rehearsal. We get maybe a hundred years if we're blessed, but then guess what? We get eternity with him. The question is, where will you spend your eternity? Where will you spend forever, ever, ever? Where will you spend forever is the main question that we should be asking ourselves. It's this baptism that takes us, that gets us the redemption, that gets us the reception, that gets us the reconstitution so that we can continually make disciples. We can continually go. We can continually teach. We can do all the things that we're called to do as a, a, a children of, of the Most High God and followers of Christ to ensure that we forward his kingdom in the earth realm. That's what it's about. Nothing more, nothing less. Here's what we're gonna get ready to do as we prepare to close. As we prepare to close, I want you to remember just a few things. First of all, that um, this increase your reach is rooted in and founded in the fact that we aren't just passive believers. We aren't called just to sit back and relax once we're saved and get our households saved. We aren't called to do that. We're called to, in fact, make sure that we're pushing out and we're doing exactly what we're needing to do to make the mission and the vision of Christ come to life in the earth realm. We're saying that as we, as we go and as we make disciples, now we need to baptize them. And as we baptize them, 
we bring them into an understanding of redemption. We get them into um, um, uh, the reception and we get them into the reconstitution of themselves. This is an incredibly important step in the development of disciples and disciple making. I, I was blessed as a father to be able to uh, baptize each member of my family, each one of our children, a tremendous opportunity to be able to say, here is the gospel and to allow for them to grow in an environment where it's not, is it perfect? Absolutely not. But do they have the opportunity to have an understanding so that they can get to a place where they actually say, yes, I want to accept Christ as my savior. And then I want to be baptized. I invite you today, wherever you are, wherever you're hearing this, that if you've never been baptized, I don't want you to get caught up in a legalistic thing. I want you to think more from an obedience standpoint. If Christ got baptized, I think I want to be like Christ. Some people say, well, you don't necessarily need to be baptized. I get that and I understand it. I go to the cross, the thief that was beside Jesus. And he said, today you will be with me um, in paradise. Well, my only answer to that is while I don't necessarily think that you must have the baptism in order to get to heaven and to secure your salvation, I don't think it's like that because remember it's grace. It's not any works that we can do that none would boast, but I would just simply respond to that by asking you, are you crucified to a cross? Are you nailed to something where it prevents you from actually doing it? Right? Obviously there are situations where it's not possible. So I don't want to bring about some sort of guilt trip or anything like that. But I want us to consider there may be some that didn't quite understand what a believer's baptism looked like. And as you're listening to this, you're thinking, well, I don't know about, should I actually do it? Shouldn't I do it? Listen, find some place that's safe. Does it have to be in a traditional church? You can get baptized in a, in a pool, wherever you can find a body of water and consider being obedient just like Christ was obedient. Because if he needed to get uh, baptized and walk in obedience, I know you and I definitely need to. And it's in doing that that we move into the next dimension of disciple, becoming a disciple and making disciples, right? So I'm going to prepare to pray. And then as we pray, uh, I want you to consider and think about um, where are you? Where does this relate for you? You might be a person that's already been baptized, so it's not even an issue for you. But now we should be thinking about who else do I need to help facilitate that? So what we're building at College Park is we want to build an environment where people feel comfortable coming, learning and growing and then applying their faith and actually doing, taking action towards their faith. Right. I want you to think about where you are. And if it's not you, then who in your sphere of influence possibly may need to have a different understanding about this notion of baptism and how we can help them move into a deeper dimension of being both a disciple and then activating into disciple makers. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time of reflection on baptizing them. Lord, we ask that you would help us to understand that there's no magic in any body of water per se, but symbolically, Lord, it means so much for us to exchange some things that we may be limited by in our sinful, sinful nature for what you offer us through the power of the Holy Spirit. So Lord, we ask that you would help us to exchange our chaos for your clarity, Lord. We ask that you would help us to exchange our fear for your faith, Lord. We ask that you would help us to change our sinful nature for your delivered nature, Lord, that we would not be perfect, but we would walk in your perfection and your covering Lord, we ask that you would bless the hearers of this today, that we would be moved, that we would not just be hearers of the word, but Lord, that in fact, we would be doers of the word. We thank you for it. We praise you for it in your blessed son. Jesus name, we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Now, finally, before we go, I just want to call out a couple of reminders. We are still for this season in our application ch challenge entitled Mission Is Possible where you're called to help one person each week um, and share your story at Pastor Chris at parklifenow.com. And uh, as you give permission, we'll share highlights with or without names 
or any identifying details, but uh, the goal is for us to be able to not just, I often pray it, not just be hearers, but to be doers of the word. And so please continue to be a part of that. And then I wanna remind you, or actually just announce, that we are in the process of building. I keep telling you about we're under construction. We're just gonna be in a state of under construction. Uh, right now, the thing that we're excited about as we're continuing to uh, increase our footprint is our YouTube page. If you would just simply go um, to uh, YouTube and look up College Park a Church, you're probably gonna need to search Long Beach or Chris Reed um, to be able to find us. We're continuing to put more things in there because there are a lot of College Park churches right now, uh, literally in this nation and uh, even the world actually. So uh, be aware of the YouTube page where you can find all of the series messages. We're starting with this series and if we have any others that we can put on there, we'll put on there, but we're starting definitely with this series. If you wanted to go back um, and listen to all of them, you could go there and listen to them there. Then I want to encourage us to continue to be a blessing to the Lone Beach Rescue Mission. During this COVID crisis, what we are called to do, we feel, is to partner with organizations that are doing the frontline work. Praise God for Long Beach Rescue Mission and the lives that they are impacting. So we encourage you to uh, look them up. Uh, you can see the wonderful work that they're doing here locally, uh, one of our local partners where they are helping those who are having, I mean, tremendous struggle. And they themselves, even in this season, you could come back to me, in this season, uh, it's, they, are, they are in need of our help. So please, it's never too late. They're continuing to do the work there. So if you would agree and you pray about it, we would ask for you to donate. And then I, I wanna bring up some, uh, and remind you of some ways to give for us here at uh, College Park Church. I want you to, number one, first pray, first pray. And then I want you to be a, a, a good steward over your resources that God has blessed you with. And then once you've done those two things, that should put you in a position to be a cheerful giver. And as such, we want to remind you of ways that you can give to help us continually grow as we're doing what God has called us to do. We can give by way of the text to give feature by just simply putting in the word give and a numerical value associated with what you would like to give to 562-263-7070. 562-263-7070. Then you can go to our, also you can go to our parklifenow.com website. There is a giving button that's there. I think it's up near the right hand side, upper right hand side. There you can push that and give, or you can go the good old fashioned way and mail a check uh, into uh, CPC at 1901 Palo Verde Avenue, Long Beach, California, 90810. Listen, that's what we want. We want you to connect with us. As we're growing together, uh, we're doing a wonderful work here and we're just getting started. So literally you're getting, on, getting in on the ground floor of what we believe is going to be a tremendous work here uh, that's originating out of the city of Long Beach. Visit us at parklifenow.com. You can learn more and see us as we continue to grow. Uh, we'd love for you to connect with us in that way. Uh, we are just excited about what God is doing there with us. So I think that's all we have. Um, I am so tremendously blessed. Next week is going to be our final installment of this particular series. We're excited about what's coming next. So stay tuned for that. You're going to hear a little bit more about that. We also invite you to this Tuesday's just prayer check-in time at 7. We're uh, already looking towards the month of June to transition into our Bible study on Tuesdays and so please make time for that as we transition into more of a Bible study format on Tuesdays in this virtual setting that we find ourselves in. We continue to pray for you. We love you. Thank you for joining with us. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you next week. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. God bless you all.